The first part of the ordination certificate and ordination service that we want to deal with, we want to deal with the actual charge. Um, a lot of people don't understand what they're taking. Um, a lot of times when we become a Christian, we always look to the blessing. It's no coincidence what you read today. We realize and learn through God using you as the instrument to teach that the blessing many times look like a curse because you don't understand it. That all along while they were cursing you as you taught, while, you, while they were persecuting you as you taught, that really God had set it up for your blessing. You have two mighty men that God used other than Jesus Christ himself. You're just going to refer to Joseph and David. Joseph, the first one. Number one, Joseph was hated all the days of his life under his brother. From a young man. Number two, his mother died when he was only about 14 years old, 13 years old, giving birth to his brother Benjamin. Number three, at, at the age of about 17 years old, his brothers were really going to kill him, but it was not in the will of the Lord. Right. So what they did, they sold him into slavery into Egypt. Number four, after he was sold into that slavery, as being faithful, he had favor with the Pharaoh, but the Pharaoh, uh, excuse me, he had favor with the chief captain of the guard, but the chief captain of the guard's wife had a liking for him. And when she couldn't get him in the bedroom, she accused him of rape, which really was supposed to put him to death again because he was accused of rape against a government official. But what ended up happening was, from slavery, he went to prison. Now, from prison, he gets into a place of interpreting a few dreams, which ultimately leads him to be in the place to become the prince of Egypt. Praise God. But everybody gets caught in the fact that he's the prince. But they miss the fact of all that other stuff that I just named. That's why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Okay. Stop looking at the titles. Stop looking at the things men did. And study their life that you might see without a shadow of a doubt that, yes, God brought them to greatness, but they went through a process. Now, let's deal with David. David, a man after God's own heart. Anointed at 17 to be king. From that point on, the king, which was Saul at the time, Saul is troubled tremendously by wicked spirits. Now David, too, was the least likely of all his brethren. That's why when the anointed came to anoint him to be king, David was not the one that his father even called. He called his other seven sons. And when the other seven sons were not received, by the prophet Samuel, who had thought one of them would have been received, but God showed him, I don't look like how men look. I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at a man's heart. So then after that, then David was called forward and anointed to be king. But from that process, he gets into the king's court because the king is troubled with a wicked spirit. And at that time, he can play the harp which is similar like to a violin of today. And he plays this and he gets favor with the king. From that place, his father sends him as his brothers and Saul, all of them are terrified about Goliath. And his father sends him to go basically be like a, a little young guy who runs to the store. Like, yo, bring your, bring your brothers these milk and cookies. Make sure they all right. Check on them. And him doing so, he comes there and he sees everybody terrified about Goliath. And so what he says is, you know, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defiles the army of the living God? And so his brother now is offended by him. His brother Eliab is offended by him. He's like, I knew you was a troublemaker. All he's doing is coming to bless. But he's basically calling him a troublemaker because he's coming in to aid the people of God. So the king is afraid. And everyone in the king's army is afraid, but David steps up and says, you know what? 
Give me Goliath. I slew the bear. I slew the lion. I know he's not greater than them. I'll slew him too. And I'll take it in the Lord's name. Not in my own. Praise God. So he slew Goliath, cuts his head off, brings it to the king, has great favor. Now the promise if you did this was you would get the king's daughter. You, your father, or your brothers and sisters would have to pay no more taxes. And great wealth would be bestowed upon you. Now the great wealth came, right? But the other things Saul was playing games with, especially the fact of his daughters, because what got to Saul was, as the woman will come, which was a tradition, they did it when Moses parted the Red Sea, the woman came and they sung songs, Exodus 15, they sung songs unto, unto the Lord. So now they're singing these songs, but while they're singing these songs, what they're singing, the king don't like. Now they came out to give the king honor. But the king didn't take it as such because the king is hearing Saul kills his thousands, but David kills his tens of thousands. Mm. Not realizing that David is subject to you, so no matter how well they thought about David, they actually think that about you because you are the one directing him and what to do. So it didn't matter what they said. But anyway, from that day, it said that envy came into his heart and he eyed David from that point forward. And from there, you have a man chased in the wilderness now. You know about his kingdom. Chased in the wilderness for 10 to 12 years mm -hmm. by Saul chasing him, trying to kill him. 21 times he attempted to kill that man. Really great, but 21 is the number that we're going to deal with. 21 times over 10, 11 years, his life was attempted to be destroyed. And then Saul finally dies, and he becomes king. Not of all Israel, of one tribe called Judah. Amen. The other 11 were not under his care. Seven years, six months later, after warring with Saul's son, Ishmael, then he becomes the king of all Israel. And he never tried to war with nothing. I thought my son was But they always forced him in. So he had a long battle, man. So today we charge you in the mighty name of Jesus according to 1 Peter 4. It says this, because I can tell you about how God's going to bless you, and that's true. But I'm going to deal with the part about what you're going to suffer. And the reason why I'm going to say that is if you wouldn't do that, you're going to get the blessing. But if you back away from that, all that God promised you can't get to you because you got to get in like Jesus. Jesus said, it's enough for the servant to be as his master. If they call the master of the house, the elder of how much more of them of his household? Praise God. So it's a blessing. See, when Jesus went on the cross, everybody got caught up in him dying because they couldn't see the resurrection. Mm. So these things that will happen to you, please receive it as a blessing because that's what it really is. It said, beloved. 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, and in this case, Minister Evans, find it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Amen. Why would you rejoice going through a trial? You know, at the end of this, I'm coming out as pure gold. Not only in heaven, but in the land of the living. Praise Amen. God. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. Praise if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken, but on your part he is glorified. Why? Because you're showing the character, the nature of Christ, and people don't realize the Bible said, whomever he forgiveth much, loveth much. So as men violate you, you be like, nah, don't worry about it. As things happen, and they still see you calm, other people be like, who is his God? And what must I do to be saved? Because they see in this glory on you that's abnormal. I see people in their deathbed, but they knew Jesus, and they was like, they ministering to the people coming to minister to them. Because they had peace. But I also seen some people there that didn't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. So if you know Christ, you're to bring that peace to them that surpasses all understanding. It said, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. So sin will cause a man to suffer, and it'll look similar 
to people watching. But this is the difference. This is how you know your suffering is of Christ. God. When you're suffering something for Jesus, you got peace. God. You got joy, and you can see the victory. Thank you, when you're suffering because of your sin, you're tormented, your spirit is vexed, and you have no peace. Thank you, Lord. So he said, as a, especially you as a minister, because God's going to deal with you. As we know, the Bible says that us ministers are judged harder mm -hmm. than everyone else. Don't think God is going to judge you like he's going to judge somebody who don't know Christ or someone who just got saved. He's going to deal with you with a higher standard because watch this. As a leader, guess what you also understand, man of God? You understand when you're misleading too. So as a leader, we're commanded not to mislead because leaders have the ability because they understand what other people are thinking, going through, and all that other stuff. We also have the ability, if we're wicked, to mislead. Praise God. So as a leader, you're commanded to lead them in the right way. He said, yet, yeah, if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. So you don't have nothing to worry about That's if you're leading like that. So my charge to you, as the man of God, is to endure hardness as a good soldier. To suffer whatever comes your way. God uses persecution, trials, and tribulations, and is personalized just for you. I won't go through, a lot of people say I have a Job experience. I ain't got no Job experience, because I didn't lose all my kids. My body didn't ball up like him. I got an Apostle King experience, and you're going to have a Minister Evans experience. He has a Pastor King, a Pastor Kevin experience, and that's all the things that you have. But endure it. Go through it. You're charged to do so. And if you agree to suffer all things, bear all things, to live holy, walk before the Lord, then we'll proceed with the service from this point on. Do you agree? Yes. Praise Amen. God. Is there anything that you want to instruct them with, um, Pastor, before? I think that was uh, pretty good right there. Praise the Lord. Excellent. Amen. Amen. With that being said, what you're going to do for him, because he's your pastor, is you're going to extend the right hand of fellowship to him. But before you extend it, I want you to understand what we're referring to. Because the Bible said, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But in all thy getting, get an understanding. So we don't do nothing without an understanding. Never go to a church that just hoops and hollers and don't teach you nothing, because all you'll be is an excited fool. You will leave out feeling good, but sickness won't leave. You'll leave out feeling good, but your poverty will never depart. You'll leave out feeling good, but them devils that's tormenting your house will never leave because all you did was feel good. You shake, you did all of this stuff that they said was the Holy Ghost, which really 99% of the time is not really him, but it could be him. You understand? When you get caught up where somebody touch your head, everybody fall out. You understand? And, and, and those type of things Jesus wasn't even running around doing. You got to be wise, man. Jesus didn't operate in those ways. So I'm just saying that as he extended the right hand of fellowship, we want to teach you something so you don't leave out ignorance. It's out of Acts 13, 1 through 3. I advise you that every scripture that was here from his teaching, which was awesome. So whatever we go through today, that you write these things down, study them for yourself, look them up in the Greek. And look up the words and see what these things mean so that you can get an understanding even in a deeper way. Praise God. Acts 13, 1 through 3 says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers and Barnabas and Simon, which is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, a Manian, which had been brought up from Herod to Terioch and Saul. And they ministered unto the Lord and fasted. This is the part we have. First, I want you to understand ordination comes from the Lord because Apostle Paul was ordained. And separated me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work. We are unto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them their way. Now, this is the Apostle Paul who God used to write about 14 books out of the New Testament. Out of the 27, he wrote probably about, about 10 at least. Now, he was used in a great and mighty way. And he himself had men ordained him. Not just there, but when he lost his sight, he had to go to another man of God 
And that man had to pray and anoint him again to receive his sight. Great. Uh, so he was anointed twice before sent out. And this is the man that went and did great things for God. We know that Jesus himself was baptized. And, and concerning the right hand of fellowship, you look over at Galatians 2, 7 through 9. And what it says, it says, we'll really look at the ninth verse. It says, and when James and Cephas, this is James and Peter and John, who had walked with Jesus. Now, Paul didn't walk physically with Jesus. Like, we didn't walk physically with Jesus, but we know Jesus just as much as men who walk physically with him because Jesus is a spirit, not the flesh. So never think these men knew him better. It's how well you know him in the spirit. Praise God. And it said, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave unto me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they to the circumcision. So one man went to the Gentile, one man went to the Jews. So as he's extending his right hand of fellowship, that's why men shake unknowingly with the right hand, because the Bible speaks about the right hand of fellowship. As he's extending that to you today, whatever that is on the Lord, that the Lord put on his heart, that's what, as you accept it, that's what you receive, and then we'll go further from there. Pastor Kevin, as you extend him the right hand of fellowship. That's my brother. I love you. And, um, you know, remember, no matter what, Jesus is the way. The problems are going to come. Yes. They're there. People are going to get on your nerves. But when the love on them, have a blessing to them and understand that we are persecuted for his sake. Amen. 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 Praise God. With that being said, I extend the right hand of fellowship with you as well. And uh, I trust and believe that the Lord leads Pastor Kevin at all times. I've never doubted his Holy Ghost. That's something we must do as leaders. We must begin to know how other people.